Hey everybody, I hope you're having a great holiday weekend. Welcome back to Reach Out Reptiles. My name is Garrett Hartle. Now, today I want to continue in our series about misconceptions about super dwarfs, finding out uh, what is the truth behind a lot of the rumors we hear and some things that may not be true. Today's question is an interesting one because it's really kind of a matter of opinion, but I figured we could jump into this anyways. Are super dwarf and dwarf articulated pythons too expensive? this week is are super dwarves too expensive so this is an interesting question because it is very subjective and it's something that you could actually argue a lot of different ways and always be right and never be wrong or always be wrong and never be right depending on how you look at it now to be able to answer this question we kind of need to uh, determine what is our perspective on life now I'm here in a beautiful new neighborhood with these awesome big homes um, you can see them, they're going up all over the place. And uh, these are homes that I'm sure a lot of us would love to live in someday. I mean, they're, they're kind of made with the average American family in mind, uh, as far as the price point in maybe the 400 thousands. Uh, they have some space, they've got a nice view. I'm sure they probably have 3.2 bedrooms, bathrooms, and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, this is kind of what we're told we need as Americans. You know, one of the funny things about society is that it's always changing and people's priorities are beginning to change as well. And so for the typical American that, that this kind of a housing market is targeted at, um, they're gonna actually be really overextended to have this kind of a life. And so yeah, they might get those things of people saying, ooh, wow, you're so successful, but then there's this darker side where they feel like they're drowning in debt and they can't get out from under it. And so, society's views on this kind of thing are beginning to change. Let me show you another way to live by comparison. Welcome to the Hartle home. Now I understand it isn't flashy and many of you may not see the appeal right away. But did you know that my grandfather built this house in 1950 with his own hands? My dad grew up here my whole life I moved around the country and the world hearing stories about things that happened in this house. So this place became legendary to me, hearing those stories as I grew up. And so when I became a father myself, there was nowhere on this planet that seemed like a more ideal location to raise a family than this place right here. Now bear with me, I do have a point and it is about whether or not super dwarves are too expensive. See, sometimes you have to look a little bit beneath the surface to see the true value of things. Now, we discussed the sentimental value of my house and why I like it, but I think even you will be able to see the value in this. For the price of the cookie cutter house, where they all look the same according to the same plans, in the 400 to 500 thousands, I could own four of these houses, live in one, and rent the other three. With the money that I made renting those other three houses out, I wouldn't even have to go to work. And I could spend all day long making amazing memories with my family, watching my children, the fourth generation of Hartles to be raised in this house. Because a life well lived or money well invested in your personal happiness is pretty hard to measure sometimes. And you may need to look beyond the immediate surface to be able to do that. So let's run some numbers about super dwarfs and see where we end up. Super dwarfs like this female, who's gonna be one year old this month. And we'll find out just how expensive a normal looking snake like this Madu Kalatoa cross really is. Okay, we can thank Riley for the artistic expression in chalk on my little educational chalkboard here. Thank you, Riley. Um, but let's get rid of that. Now that we've immortalized it for the ages on YouTube, 
Okay, so to look at what a snake actually costs, you can't just wander into a reptile show, see a price tag on a tub, and say, oh look, that, that amount, that number, matches the amount of money I happen to have in my wallet, so I should buy this animal. Now you really want to look at the cost to raise this animal. I've been keeping raising and breeding reticulated pythons, mainlands, all the way down through super dwarfs, for a couple of decades now. So I'm gonna throw some numbers out there that you might not be aware of. I'm gonna factor in three of the main categories, that is caging, food, and utilities, that it's gonna cost, and we're gonna do this on the basis of raising a female to sexual maturity or the point at which she could lay eggs, which is faster for a mainland, it's only four years. And uh, for a super dwarf, we're gonna say five years, and we'll take this on average. They could go faster, they might take longer, but these are gonna be good, safe numbers, the kind you would use if you were actually running investment strategies. Now the first category is gonna be caging. So what I did here was just jump on animal plastics, pick an appropriately sized cage from a commercial aspect, throw in a few options that I would need, as well as shipping out to my place. These are cheap, kind of minimalistic, industry standard cages. Now the second category is going to be food. Okay, these are from rodent pro prices based on kind of the recommended diet. This is not trying to stunt an animal to keep it small or push an animal extremely hard to get it to grow. And as you will see, our mortgages on these different animals are really starting to be very different. And the final category is going to be the utilities. Now taking a look at some of these numbers, you can see there's a huge difference between Mainland and Super Dwarf. And I really hope that you take these kinds of things into consideration when you define what it means to you if an animal is expensive or not. Now, if we add all these up and I buy a Mainland retic female and I raise her up to four years old on kind of like the industry standard commercialized method, which is actually the minimal amount possible to raise and breed these animals. Over the cost of four years, that female is going to cost me $2,736. That's a free animal. The super dwarf animal, over the cost of five years that it takes to get her up to egg size, is going to cost me $661. Let's take the difference of the two to find out what's really going on here. If you got a super dwarf female instead of a mainland female, over the course of time it takes to grow that girl up just until she's an adult. We're not talking about maintaining them over 30 years of life. This is just growing them from a baby to an adult. I'm going to save 2,070... Did you guys hear that? That was a really loud snake fart. Okay, I think she's... I think she's just about done. I am going to save $2,075. And again, this does not include any of the purchase price of the animals. But let's say, for example, you got a pure mainland, just a normal, no genetic traits whatsoever, and it cost you $150. And then you went out and got yourself a pure locality Kalatoa, or maybe a Madu or Karampa as they become available, with more people focusing on breeding these animals you would have quite a budget to spend up front and still end up spending the same amount of money on that animal. Now here's some of the other things that you could do with that money that you saved. What if instead of keeping the animal in the absolute minimum size required cage, you put the super dwarf animal into that giant cage and made a huge naturalistic setup that you and the animal could both enjoy. You'd have an extra thousand dollars easily to spend on that cage and do that kind of an upgrade. You could actually afford a locally grown varied diet. Things like quail, chickens, guinea pigs, rabbit, all these different meat sources that would be amazing for that animal to have grown locally and supported locally your local business. Or if you look at it this way, you could afford an additional three more super dwarfs and have four retics instead of one. And now you have an entire breeding project, maybe one male and three females from a rare and highly coveted locality animal retic that you could actually be a contributor to the hobby and helping that bloodline to continue on rather than finding out kind of the dark side of retic keeping that a lot of people who have kept and bred if you see people who've bred retics maybe a handful of times 
They began to start saying things like, hey, they're being overproduced. I can't move my babies. The price has come down too fast. The market is all messed up. These are all things that you start to hear from people that didn't factor in if they breed animals, they're going to have to move those animals. And who's going to be wanting to buy those? I mean, let's be real for a minute. All right? How many people are there that could responsibly keep an animal that gets about the size of like an adult carpet python, such as a pure super dwarf mite, versus the amount of people that can really responsibly keep a beautiful giant mainland reticulated python that's capable of exceeding a one to 200 pounds? And when you work for years to produce animals that feel like they're an extension of your very self by that time, Whose hands are you going to want to place those babies in? Just an end game kind of thought, so you might want to think about in the beginning. Now, if I could be so bold as to challenge you with just one more thing to think about. I know that it can be hard to wait, especially in a culture that often worships instant gratification. But the funny thing about the market is it has a tendency to balance things out in its own way. You see, Animals that are easily available, like a mainland morph retic, you can go out any day. If you don't believe me, test this on social media. Throw out a morph you like and say who has one for sale as a mainland and see what pops up and who has animals with current availability ready to go. Now run that same experiment on social media with something like a pure superdorf locality. Name your locality and ask a popular reticulated python group if anybody has any available. And I think what you're going to find is that people either say, well, I'm working on those, I'm working on those, and I'll have some soon. Or you're going to find a situation where people are misrepresenting something, taking something of a lesser value and trying to make it seem like it's more valuable, as a lot of uh, less than reputa reputable people do. And so looking at the hard numbers, let's say that a mainland female in our example, just a normal, was $150 and a pure locality, maybe let's take the most commonly available one. We're not talking morphs, guys, not crosses, but a pure locality Kalatoa female. It's gonna be about $1,000, but you're gonna have a hard time finding one that's sitting around available. Like for example, when I breed pure Kalatoas, people find out about it, and then they contact me saying, hey, when is the next clutch coming? Are you gonna try again in 2019 to make any pure Kalatoas? Will you please notify me when that happens? And the balance is that it might take you a little bit longer to set that money aside to prepare for that initial purchase of that animal. Huh, baby, yeah, sometimes it does. But in the long run, I think you're gonna find that you will have either a lot less expenses that you come into with ownership or a lot more money left over that you can spend giving your animal the best possible life. And with amazing animals like these, I think it's the life they deserve, don't you? Thanks again for tuning in, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Sorry if I got a little bit preachy, but I do think that a lot of times we rush into things in, in today's society, and we get in over our heads, and then you know we get burnt out, we get depressed, we get sad, and instead of planning something out, sticking through and following through with that, and then having a really rewarding result at the end of all of our diligence, I don't know, I've just found that it's made me a whole lot happier and you know, with reticulated pythons, that answer has come in the form of these amazing little super dwarfs. You guys have an awesome holiday weekend and maybe keep this stuff in mind as we go into the holiday shopping season. Take care everybody, we'll see you next time.